So BTK inhibitor-based therapy fundamentally has changed our management for, for CLL. I think another drug that is fundamentally changing our management for CLL is the BCL2 small molecule inhibitor and venetoclax. It is a potent inducer of apoptosis in patients in CLL cells, and we get very deep remissions uh, with uh, venetoclax-based therapy in the frontline setting and in the relapse setting. Um, I'd like to sort of transition over into that strategy um, in terms of uh, frontline therapies, uh, venetoclax-based therapy. Maybe you can talk a little bit about minimal residual disease, depth of remission, and why we think that's important. Um, maybe you can start with that sure. topic. And yeah, thanks, Bill. So the, the important study is the German CLL-14 study, which was an international study comparing the winner of the CLL-11 study which is abinutuzumab with chlorambucil versus abinutuzumab with venetoclax. That study also met its primary endpoint um, where uh, the combination was associated with an improvement in progression-free survival, but not overall survival. What that, what's appealing about that trial is it's a fixed duration uh, trial. The patients only receive treatment for roughly tw uh, 12 months. Um, there's still... Um, issues with uh, tumor lysis, um, infusion reactions. Um, so they're, they're, while the majority of patients uh, could be treated, it, it, it's not straightforward. Um, patients often require hospitalization, particularly if they've got um, uh, significant tumor bulk. If they've got a degree of renal impairment, then their tumor lysis risk goes up a category. So I, my practice is anyone with high risk disease or moderate risk disease with impaired renal function, I'd admit to hospital. So that may be an issue in patients with community-based uh, practice. But again, it, it looks like a, a really good option. I, I think we're very lucky we've got several good options to treat patients with frontline CLL. Um, and some patients might like a, a fixed duration therapy, some are happy with continuous therapy. Um, but you, you have to look at, um, as, as we've all discussed before, individual patient factors, what the patient's uh, wishes are, their comorbidities, uh, when, when selecting which therapy is most appropriate. So lots of choices, I would agree. Maybe, Jackie, you can give us your thoughts on how you select and what helps you to select and recommend a treatment, because most of our patients come to us for a recommendation. I, we do have occasional patients who will come and say, I want this or I want this clinical trial. Um, which is great, but I think most of our patients look to us for direction and um, recommendations. So what are things that help you in terms of making recommendations for fixed duration, venetoclax-based first-line therapy versus a BTK inhibitor-based therapy? Yeah, so I think we're in an era of truly personalized medicine when we see the patient as a whole. Um, we need to know their um, comorbidities because that might affect the ability to tolerate certain drugs or the other. If you have renal insufficiency, I may not be as willing to um, give you a drug that may cause TLS because it can be um, very um, scary to have someone get TLS while you're on venetoclax or even obinutuzumab. Um, and if you have cardiac arrhythmias, I may uh, sway you away from, from that. Um, if you have, of course, 17 p deletion patients, I would never choose um, chemoimmunotherapy regimen. I would only choose um, as of right now, ibrutinib, because we have very good data for 17p um, deletion patients. And even when I saw the data uh, presented recently for the obinutuzumab with venetoclax trial in 17p deletion patients, the PFS wasn't as good as what we have seen previously um, for ibrutinib deleted patients in first line for 17p deletion. So um, a BTK would be my choice for a 17p deletion at this moment in time. Now, which one of the BTKs? It depends on their comorbidities. If I think of the patient may have way too many uh, cardiac toxicities or bleeding events, I may talk to the patient about using acalabrutinib um, instead of ibrutinib. And if the patient is mutated, like I said before, I would consider some chemoimmunotherapeutic approach as a possibility. There's not like one size fits all at this moment. Uh, TLS is something that we worry about. Um, it was reported with venetoclax in the early phase one clinical trial. Um, and that trial actually was, um, and others were put on hold at the time to redesign initiation and escalation. But I think it's done relatively safely now. Um, 
initiation and escalation, and we really don't see very much TLS, um, clinical TLS, uh, on the clinical trials, at least if we follow the recommendations mm -hmm. for uh, venetoclax initiation. I wonder, Carolyn, if you could maybe comment on what your experience has been with venetoclax initiation in either the frontline or the relapse setting. And yeah, yes, um, I, I mean, we participated in the CLL14 study as well, and it's, it's quite interesting that the TLS reports from that study actually were with obinutuzumab, oh, mm -hmm. um, and the way the, um, the study was designed with the obinutuzumab to start before the venetoclax actually le leads to, uh, you know, a reduction in the white cell count of, you know, almost to zero in most patients before they initiate venetoclax. So it reduces the TLS risk because obviously um, absolute lymphocyte count is one of the uh, markers for TLS risk. So, so we actually didn't have, we had to admit a couple patients at the early part of the study because the protocol mandated it didn't allow you to reassign uh, TLS risk. But in, in current practice, I would reassess TLS risk and if the patient didn't have lymph nodes of more than five centimeters and the lymphocyte count drops with the abinutuzumab, I would comfortably provide the venetoclax as an outpatient. And the, the same with the Murano um, in, that, in that study, obviously the rituximab is added after the dose ramp up for the venetoclax. So you're starting venetoclax in a patient as they are with their TLS risk. You don't get to modify the risk first. Um, we, I'm very comfortable giving IV hydration in the outpatient setting and having the patient take their drug first thing in the morning and reassess at the, the labs at the end of the day within the treatment area and only admit if there's some sort of sign of, uh, of uh, a problem with the labs. And I really don't see it often at all. Usually at most you see you know, one minor change, but certainly not TLS. Um, I, think, I think that uh, with experience even um, smaller centers can, can become competent at, at providing the agent. You just have to obviously start with a bit more caution. And be familiar with exactly. the drugs.